you may be seated, church. Just a few quick announcements. First, we want to thank our visitors that are visiting us this morning. We hope you were encouraged and enjoyed the fellowship with us after the service.
And so um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for them this week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer on this. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the sun. We thank you for um, just giving us this beautiful day after uh, the last day of rain and, and wind and overcast. Lord, we just uh, we know we need that, Lord, but uh, we, we thank you for this day. This beauty that you reminds us of just how powerful you are, how in control of, of nature you are, Father. And so we just thank you and praise you for that. And Father, we pray for something in our communities around us, Father. We pray that we would be able to reach them with the gospel, with your love. Show them that there is light in a world where darkness seems to just show itself uh, all the time, Father. So we just pray that you would um, give us boldness to speak, boldness to share, and that you would allow people to come into our pathways that need to hear of your love, that need the gospel message, that need your son. Father, we pray for New Salem Baptist as they prepare in the, in the um, coming weeks to be here. We pray that there would be no snags. We thank you that um, you just allowed everything to come together quickly, Father that you have placed it on their hearts, that you you showed your, your provision and your providence in this by uh, just allowing things to come through. Father, we pray for the chain of lights as we prepare for this, Father, as we have um, stuff out in the fellowship hall now as we, we prepare to uh, begin some of the early, um, early uh, setup that you would just uh, be with us, bless us, Father, Help us keep our hearts and minds open to the conversations that happen. We pray that this year we would um, just be able to reach more as, as people. Uh, they were surprised to see us there last year as part of this, and we just pray that um, this year, as, as we've seen already, that there's early um, interest from the community, uh, that we would be able to just best represent you and that you would give us those opportunities. And finally, Father, we pray for First Church in Charlestown and Pastor Eric today. Father, we pray that you would just bless them as they are um, going through uh, so much transition as you're blessing Eric as he's been able to go full time now. And, um, just that church is beginning to reap some of the benefits of that, Father. And so we just pray that you would continue to work there and just um, continue to, to have your Holy Spirit witness to the people there as they uh, go out into the community, as they talk with the people, as uh, you've given Eric and Sam uh, chances to um, just be able to, to be active and, and be a uh, person for people to go to in times of trouble and uh, different things, Father. I thank you that you've opened those doors for them, and I just pray that you would just continue to use that to help that ministry grow there. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Children are dismissed to kids' camp. Yes. Running quickly. They, they enjoy it, I think. All right. So today we are beginning a new series, Teachings. This continues our study through the Gospel of Mark, but um, we're going to a point where Jesus is teaching the disciples many things. And today, remember I said there were hard things in the Bible a couple of weeks ago? We're, we're going to be in Mark 10, 1 through 12, and this is the teaching on divorce. And this is something that a lot of pastors do not like to go through. They do not like to teach. Um, for whatever reason, they do that. But it is something that we must talk about. It is something that happens. It is something that divides the church because the church has one way of saying one thing and another. Other churches have another way of saying it. But let us, before we go into this, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, 
we ask that your Holy Spirit just pour himself in this place today. I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to what is said. I pray that as we go through this, Father, that um, we can go through it in such a way that shows your love, your compassion to those that have already gone through a divorce, Father. I pray that your spirit would just speak through me today and that uh, he would just uh, be here in our presence as we go through this portion. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, divorce is something that is really a difficult thing to talk about because it's all touched our lives in one way or another. Um, I remember right after Natalie and I got married, her parents went through a divorce. 25 years of marriage. And for whatever reason, um, her father decided that was it. And they seemed like a happy married couple. But one thing that Life Way Research and others have shown is that in the church today, 65% of people in the church have gone through a divorce. It is rampant in the church. It is actually more divorces happen today in the church than it does in the secular world, outside our walls. So you can understand why today, as I prepared for this, this week, this was something that I had wrestled with because so many pastors do not like to talk on the subject. They're afraid of hurting people and insulting people and, and chasing people away instead of praying for the Spirit to just come on them and just uh, let the Spirit do the teaching and not them. So let us go into the Bible. It says, And he left there and went to the region of Judah, and beyond the Jordan, and the crowds gathered to him again. And again, he was, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his, wife, his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and again, an, uh, adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, this, uh, this sounds bad. Let's, let's put it this way. But we're going to walk through this. We're going to see, you know, I know this because I know many of you have gone through this. So I don't want you to sit there and, and worry that you're, you're living in sin or anything. We're going to see what, what this all means. Now the first part we look at is this. Divorce is because of the hardness of hearts. And the Pharisees, which we've learned Jesus' Natural enemies here in the Gospel of Mark, they pop up again. They, they are trying to make Jesus stumble. They're, they're working their hardest. They are sitting there saying, we're going to make him trip up so we can just get him and have people stop following him. Now, to understand where the Pharisees were coming from, we have to look at this. Now, Jesus sits here and he says, and... Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. 
The key thing is there, because of your hardness of heart. That is the first reason that we see divorce listed. Now, to understand where the Pharisees are coming from, you have to understand that they follow two schools of law, Shammai and Hillel. They follow a book called the Talmud. Now, the Talmud is not an inspired work of Scripture, much like we have with the Bible. The Old Testament is what they would have followed, and that's where Jesus is coming from. He doesn't quote the Talmud. He quotes the Scriptures, because that is what has more authority. Now, at this time, too, the Pharisees knew that Jesus was there right at the time that Herod had just remarried. So they're, they're sitting there, and scholars think that maybe they were trying to get Jesus to insult Herod for his remarriage and put Jesus to death, much the way Herod had just put his cousin John the Baptist to death. But Jesus instead goes back to Scripture, and we see that here. Now notice here, this is what it says, this is what Moses gave them. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency, and I highlighted that because that's key, okay, in her, and he, he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and then sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house. So this is this is the law. This is what Moses wrote. This is what God told Moses to write. The indecency thing there is key, and we're going to go to that in our third point. But what ends up happening here is this is where the school of uh, the two schools of law by Shammai, which. I, I should have written these down because these are really interesting ways to say it. And Hillel um, interpreted. Shammai interpreted more, more of this way, indecency. In other words, did she cheat on her husband? Hillel was more liberal. He looked at the whole thing and finds no favor in his eyes. Maybe she's ugly. Go ahead and divorce her. Maybe she burnt your food. Go ahead and divorce her. That was the way of thinking back at that time. That is what Jesus was dealing with. So Jesus' answer, he goes back to the scripture. He goes back to what happened. And what we see is that in truth, Marriage is supposed to be a lifelong commitment and a symbol. What is it a symbol of? Well, let's look. The marital commitment is to be a lifelong contract between husband and wife. It is also a symbol of our commitment to God. It is a symbol of Israel's commitment to God. But we're going to get into that a little bit down the road here. The Pharisees took Moses out of context because they like to have their things. Think of King Henry VIII. Everybody know King Henry VIII? The reason why King Henry from uh, England decided to separate from the Catholic Church? Because he wanted a male heir. So his first wife, she was only able to give him a female heir who became Queen Mary. His second wife, who he got through an annulment through the Catholic Church, she still gave him a female heir, who became Queen Elizabeth the first. And then he wanted, he still wanted that male heir. He still wanted that legit carry the name. Forget that this is my daughter. I want a male heir to carry the Tudor name. And so he went ahead and he found a way to basically usurp the church. And this is basically the way that the Pharisees were doing. They were usurping God's law by interpreting the scripture the way they wanted to. <clears throat> and 
Jesus' own words show how superficial the Pharisees' view was. The second point is this. And like I've said, marriage is like our relationship with God. Look at this. Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. I had to re-look that up in, in the Testament, because I'm, I'm, I'm used to saying no man separate, but that's the way it's translated here. Let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again, about this matter. So we see that marriage is a symbol of our commitment to God. Now, Israel had an interesting relationship with God. I'm telling you, you need to study the Old Testament. The one thing about it, Israel, and we've talked about this, is there's like this circle. Israel follows God, and they're all like, yes, this is great, this is awesome, this is beautiful. And then things are going so good, they start saying, you know what, we don't need to go and see, you know, worship God down at the temple. And all of a sudden, they're building their own little idols, and they start following Moloch, and we learned about Moloch a few weeks ago. And, you know, they start following some of the other God's Asherah and everything. And God gets angry at them. And God doesn't like it. Eventually God puts them into some kind of turmoil, some kind of trial, some kind of punishment. They turn back to God and God rescues them. But we see that God wanted to show them this. He uses a man by the name of Hosea to show the symbol to them. Now, it's interesting because what God asks Hosea to do, I don't know of anybody who would do this today. Let's look. This is what Hosea chapter 2 says. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of whoredom, and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom for forsaking the Lord. So what we see is God takes marriage. Marriage is that symbol, just like us, our relationship with Him, the church's relationship with Jesus, Israel's relationship with God the Father, takes that into a whole lot of symbolism to remind us of what is supposed to happen. Now, Hosea marries this woman. Her name is Gomer. Not to be confused with Gomer Pyle. That would be a man. It's not what God wanted. But this woman, Gomer, when you read the story, and you should read the story of Hosea, it's very interesting because she has these children, and Hosea really doesn't know if these children are really his or if they're the other guys. But he still loves them. Much like God still loves us, no matter what we do, Hosea sits there and he loves these children. He loves his wife. And eventually he goes and he ransoms her and finally brings her into the home. And God redeems this relationship. But it is a whole symbol of what God has gone through by sending his son for us, for the church. What God has done for Israel. Marriage is a commitment, and it takes time to work on. We have to remember that we have to continuously date our spouse. Like, if we want our marriage to succeed, we need to continue to marry. It's not, it's, it's not, I'm done, I've married you, that's it. You've got to continuously marry, date them. Remember why you married them. Remember why you love them. Fall in love with them all over again. You know, Natalie and I, some of our best date nights have been $5 dates as we call them. We'll go down to the 
coffee shop, spend five dollars, share a cup of coffee, and maybe a, a, a sandwich, cut it in half, and just sit there and talk with one another. And just remember those times when we were younger, when she was 19 and I was 22. Those are the things that God wants us to do, to remind us, to continuously bring us back to Him. So the thing is, is you need to spend time with God. You need to continuously take time to pray, take time to break open the Bible, read it, make notes. You know, I've got this one, this is my one with notes. You make notes in it. Remember what God is telling you. He wants you to, to see, to fall in love with Him all over again. And that's the thing. We need to continuously work. So marriage is like a is that relationship that we continue to work on, and we need to continuously work on our relationship with God. God doesn't want people to enter marriage thinking that they have an option for getting out of it. If we enter into marriage with the pretense that it's permanent, then we know that we are doing something that is something so serious, so looked on by God as important. That we need to work on. The interesting thing here is that the Pharisees saw the husband as the one who could initiate the divorce, but when we look at Jesus' own words, he mentions the wife was able to. That shows where the Pharisees and, and, and the law at the time was so full of itself where they were just all about the men. They didn't care about the women. The problem with the women was if a woman ended up getting divorced by her husband, then she was put into this poverty. If she had children, those children were then considered no longer legitimate. And so those children were looked upon as these illegitimate children and Nobody would touch them. Nobody would care for them. But Jesus reminds them that this went both ways. Ponders the question of why. Ponders the question, is there a legitimate reason? Well, we've seen it. We've seen one. This is where the Bible allows divorce under certain circumstances. This is the thing that we need to understand. Now, it's not saying that we should divorce, and we're going to see that. But let me show you here. Because this is, this is the thing that really gets people all the time. This is, what, this is where pastors struggle when they teach this. This is where pastors like sit there and, and, and they don't want to teach it. And that's where, the, that's where it really, really, really is a disservice to God when a pastor does not want to teach on this. Because we get to this point and a pastor sits there and worries, what about the people in my church that have gone through this? Because we see here, whoever divorces his wife marries, and marries commits uh, another, commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband, marries another, she commits adultery. But look at this. We're going to see marital unfaithfulness. These are the three reasons. Matthew's take on this shows more. Now remember, there, there's the four Gospels, and the four Gospels each tell a, a certain point of view of the Gospel message. And it, this is the thing, as, as we saw when we, when we watched um, Case for Christ, you know, if we didn't have the differences, we wouldn't think that this is all true. But Matthew adds this. He adds in, except on the ground of sexual immorality. So in other words, if there is somebody in that marriage that is committing adultery, that is allowed because that person has already forsaken their marriage vows. We have to remember that marriage is a symbol of our relationship with God. God wants us to be fully committed to Him. He wants us to be fully committed Christians, fully committed followers. And it should be mentioned that if a spouse 
agrees to work because of their indiscretion, all right? So if somebody comes in and says, I cheated on you and I'm sorry and forgive me, and they want to work that out, you should work that out. Because we have to remember that God, God has forgiven us our sins. But if the person is a habitual cheater, if the person continues to go out and cheat, I would say that's okay. Why? Because you're putting your health at risk. In this day and age, we have sexually transmitted diseases. And we're going to see something a little bit later in this, where it shows that the spouse has a moral commitment to their family. And if they're putting their health at risk and putting the health of their spouse at risk, I don't think that's what God wants. I think God wants us to be able to work things out. Now, it's not saying that that hasn't happened. I've, I've seen stories where uh, a husband had committed adultery and, and contract, contracted the HIV virus and then admitted it to his wife. And the two of them worked it out, but the two of them had this life-long sentence of the HIV virus. But God blessed them through it. He gave them strength to conquer it. The second point is to an unbeliever. Now I've seen this myself. I've seen a person who had been in church and then all of a sudden just decided that the Bible was wrong, that Stephen Hawkins and, and um, Dawkins and all those other guys were, were correct, that, you know, it was the big man and, and, you know, we're just little amoebas that evolved. And he made life a living hell for his wife. This is what it says here. I say to the rest I say, not I, not I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, he should not divorce him. Now, it allows for divorce to a non-believer. But he puts this in here. And the reason being is because if, and, and this happens in many cases, if a husband is a non-believer, and I've seen it mainly with, with the husband, it, it is, it, it's a tough road. But if that husband loves her and loves the children and continues to walk down that path, sometimes, and this is what Paul gets, sometimes through the wife's righteousness or through the husband's righteousness, the other spouse comes to Christ because they see that love, they feel that love, they feel that sacrifice. They just love it. They realize that God is real. Why would you love me? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the most miserable son of a gun in the world, and yet you have stayed with me. That's what it shows. But again, it's a very hard road for those people. And if you know somebody who is in that situation, be praying for them. Put them on a list and be praying for them. Pray for the spouse. Go out and have coffee with the spouse. Just start to work. Start to show God's love to that person. The final thing is this, abuse in marriage. Now, this isn't particularly in the Bible. It doesn't particularly say, but there are verses that people use as the keys to show why. Part of the thing is, is in the marriage commitment, the spouses have committed to provide for one another. When they commit to provide for one another, what has happened is they have committed to show not just love and support, but care. A husband's greatest act in many cases 
that we've seen through history is being able to lay down his life for his wife and for his children, much the way Christ lays down his life for us. And that's one of the things. We, the husbands, husbands, we are that symbol of Christ in the marriage. So we're going to look at four verses. Now Peter writes this, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Paul writes this, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. In other words, don't yell at them, don't hit them, love them. Don't do psychological abuse, physical abuse, love them. Paul writes this to Timothy, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's harsh. But that's basically going back. That's saying, if you're not providing, if you're not showing not just the love and commitment, but everything else, you are worse than an unbeliever. Finally, we get to this, and this is what I was saying earlier. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So let me stop and say this. If you have become a follower of Christ since divorce, and you're fully committed, you are there, you're here, you love the Lord. Don't worry about what you've seen about being an adulterer or anything like that. You're not. My dad had been married when he was young. And he was in the Air Force, and he made mistakes, and he ended up divorcing his first wife. And I am the child of the second marriage. But my father, in that time between his divorce and his remarriage, he had come to know Christ. He had come to follow Christ. He had come to study the Scriptures. He came to this point where he wanted to be a minister, and he wrestled with that because like I said, many denominations have their own beliefs about what the Bible says about divorce. There are some denominations that would sit there and say, you cannot be a pastor. There are some denominations that say, you can be a pastor. For my father, he took his ordination. He lived his life. He was married to my mother for almost 30 years before the Lord took her home. He showed nothing but love and grace and everything that the Bible says for her. For his children from his first marriage, he took care of them as much as he could. There were some things that happened that made those relationships difficult, especially with my sister. But in the end, they knew that he loved them. Now, the reason why I bring that is because, again, this is a hard thing to swallow. There are people that wrestle with this. They wonder, does God love you? God loves you. Let me tell you, God loves you so much that he gave his son to die for you. And if you are here and you are following him, know that that love does not change anything of that love. But everything that you've seen, everything that we've studied, God has wiped that away. As he's wiped away your sins, he's wiped away all of that. Look and see what God is blessing in marriage. To understand God better, husbands realize you reflect him in your marriage. You reflect Jesus to your wife. 
Wives, you, you are bride. And look at what Jesus calls the church. He calls the church his bride because he loves us so much. And that's the thing. God wants us to have that relationship in our marriages. We are here and we love to fellowship with one another. We are here and we love just gathering on Sundays to love on one another. In fact, we're going to be loving somebody after we're done here because we as a family love each other. So this is what we need to do. We need to work on those relationships. Start having deep friends. If you don't already start having do the five dollar date night. Believe me, it is for me. It, I like five dollar date nights better than going out and having a, a, a movie and dinner. Because a movie and dinner, movie uh, dinner, you can talk. Movie, you're not talking to one another. You're watching, you know, whatever is going on, whatever Chris Pine or Chris uh, Evans or whoever is on the screen is doing. But. You know, coffee as a date is awesome because you're able to fellowship, talk with one another, rekindle all those things. And that's what God wants. He wants us to rekindle. He wants us to go into His Word and study and pray daily. He wants us to remember that we, in our marriages, must reflect His relationship with us as the church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice of your son. Father, we, we know that um, so much is said in, in the world today. So much is just made that divorce is the second hand. Father, for those here that I know that have gone through it, Father, I pray your love just shows on them. Father, love on them. Remind them that you are their Abba. You are their Father. Father, and just remind them of, of just the love and sacrifice that their spouses have given to show that commitment to them. Father, I pray that as we go forward today, as we leave this building, that we would remember that as your ambassadors, our marriages are to reflect that. I pray, Father, for those who would see, those who maybe have told any one of us over the years that they want to have a marriage like ours. Father, just remind us how important that is. Remind us how important that reflects your relationship with us. Your, your relationship with this church and all the capital C church. Father, I pray that as we go forward today, as we take the offering, that you would use it for the ministry here going forward. Help us, Father, as we look to reach our community. Father, help us to shine that light, be that city on the hill. Now, Father, go with us and give us a good day and a good week until we gather again next week. We ask this all in Jesus' name.